Here's where we're going today. If Christians, if as Christians, there is a different method of navigating life that goes beyond just following a set of moral teachings. As Christians, if there's a different method of navigating life, what is that different way? And the different way, again, I've, 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 I've titled it, and now we will unpack it. The different way is the divine initiative. The, the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life that leads you, at times, to go a direction that does not line up with your common sense and your creative initiative. The divine initiative. Matthew chapter 2. We've been, in, we've been in Matthew, this is the, I think this is the fourth week. Um, we've, we've, we've read, last week we read the story of the Magi. Um, you may have heard them referred to as the wise men, or you might have even heard them referred to as the three kings, although they were not, in that day, they would not have had any sort of uh, royalty attached to them. So, now, where we left off is where we're beginning. Matthew chapter 2. Um, you, read, you read silently as I read out loud. It says, when they, and they are, re- the, 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 the plural pronoun is referring to the magi, the, the wise men. When they had gone, you remember they came and visited Jesus, and then, and then in a dream they were told, don't go back to Herod, because Herod has, um, it has, has a, a evil intentions. He wants to kill the Messiah, so don't go, back to, don't go back and see him. So they went a different way home, back to the east or the northeast or wherever they were from. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. What did he say? Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Verse 14, so he got up. Now, I, I, there's a pattern here that I want to point out. In fact, we're even going to say this out loud together because I want, you, I want to just drill down deep on what's going on here. Verse 13, right in the middle, the angel who appeared to Joseph in the dream, he says, get up. Verse 14 says, so he got up. Now this pattern, back and forth, the angel says, get up, so he got up. I want you to say this with me. Get up, so he got up. Will you do that with me? Get up, so he got up. That was weak. Do it one more time. Get up, so he got up. We're going to do it one more time. Here we go. Get up, so he got up. Okay. There are times in your life, perhaps, there are times in my life when about all I can do is I hear the word, I hear, I hear the Lord speak, and it might go something like this. Get up, and I, have, I don't have the strength to do anything else except, okay, I can just obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So he got up. Going on, verse 15, so he got up. Took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. Verse 15 where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. There's another one of those little, remember we talked about this little, uh, little exercise that, that Matthew's doing. He's going to do it ten, ten different times where he says the prophet said it, and here's, here, here it's, it's now happening. Verse 16 When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. There it is again, another one of those little exercises, literary exercises. Verse 18, a voice is heard in Ramah, weeping, In great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Again, a a, a quotation out of the Old Testament. Matthew's saying, look, here it is, shining headlights on this. 
two times in the last several verses. Here's, a, here's another uh, Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled. What's, what's Matthew trying to do? He's pointing out this is the Messiah. This is no ordinary baby. This is God incarnate. <clears throat> Going on, verse 19. In Herod, uh, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and go back, I'm adding that word, and go back to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. Verse 21, so he got up. There it is, again, verse 20, the angel of the Lord says, get up. About all perhaps uh, Joseph has strength to do is simply in obedience, he got up. The divine initiative is spoken, and he at least has the strength to respond. Verse 21, so he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that um, Archelaus, that's, that's the son of, 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 of Herod, Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, this is another dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. One more time, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that, we, that, uh, that he would be called a Nazarene. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about just the richness of this story for a moment. The Magi came and, and they gave these gifts, uh, these valuable gifts to the Christ child. And then they left, and having been warned in a dream not to go see Herod, they left and returned home a different way. The divine initiative, God saying, don't go this way, go that way. And so they did. Why is God... Why is God initiating divinely because he's writing a story. The storyline of the gospel, God is writing that, and so he is initiating divinely because he's got an intention about this story. What I want to compel you to believe this fall is that God is now continuing to write a story. It, it is called the, the kingdom of heaven. And, and as, you, as you become attuned to the divine initiative, what is, what is happening in that process is, is God is initiating divinely the choices, the decisions of your life because he is writing you as well into the story of the development of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So, so the, the, the Magi are gone, and Joseph and Mary and the baby are, are in Bethlehem at that point, and it seems, from the story, it seems uh, to be implied that they're thinking about staying here. Remember, they're not from here. They're actually from Galilee. We know that from the book of Luke, from, 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 the, from the gospel of Luke. So they're, they've traveled from Galilee. They've traveled, and they're here in Bethlehem, but it seems as though they're thinking about staying. We know that they'd been there for a while because it'd taken a while for the Magi to get there. They're in Bethlehem, and they're, 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 I guess, going to stay because it's the word of the Lord, the, 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 the angelic dream only that causes them to leave. The angel says, no, you can't stay here. You, you must leave because Herod, evil King Herod, is going to kill. And the Messiah, the, the, the baby Jesus, will be killed in that process. You must, you must go. And so, um, uh, many scholars have said this prior, prior to my saying it now, uh, in, in this divine initiative, God laying out the path and God moving them along the path as he does you every day, in this, in this process, it's quite probable that, that the way that Mary and Joseph and the baby were able to take flight and go to Egypt, which would have cost a lot of money, and, and live in Egypt for Months, years, we don't know. Uh, no doubt years, um, but we don't know how many. Um, 
how, did, how was all that funded? We know that they were poor. Uh, think a you know, 20-year-old car getting them to wherever they go. Think of just, just, just getting by, just making ends meet. How'd they get the, well, many people have said this before me, and that is that it's quite probable that, that the, the gifts that the Magi uh, delivered on that day was God providing that they might have a way to get to Egypt, that they might have a way to stay and, and, and provide for the Son of God during their time there. And after a season, the angel of the Lord speaks, uh, this divine initiative speaks into Joseph's life and says, okay, uh, Herod's dead. Um, You can go back to Israel right now. And apparently, Joseph had decided, they must have taken a a liking to Bethlehem because apparently they're going to go back to to Judea, uh, perhaps back straight to uh, Jerusalem, I mean to to Bethlehem, or maybe they're going to go live in Jerusalem. Maybe they thought, it's the Son of God. We should live in Jerusalem. We should live next to the temple. I mean, he is the Son of God. We don't know, but but we do know that they were headed back to Judea because then they're fearful because then they find out that that, that Archelaus, uh, the ruthless son of Herod, who, was, who had a reputation for being just as ruthless, he is now ruling half the kingdom. He is now ruling Judea, uh, over Judea. And so what happens? Uh, Joseph, his heart was filled with fear. Well, we're going back to a, a situation that, that, is, that is no better. It's, it's even worse, perhaps, because Archelaus had this reputation as being ruthless. Now, what isn't addressed in this passage, uh, but what we know from history is that Archelaus' brother, who was, who was apparently much more reasonable, he was not ruthless, he was ruling over Galilee. And so Nazareth, Galilee, which is, which is where, uh, where Mary and Joseph were, were from anyway, that, would have been a safe, that was a safer place to go. And so a third dream... Um, that that Joseph has, the angel a third time in this little pericope, because a third time the angel tells Joseph, no, don't don't go to Judea. That would be unsafe. Archelaus reigns there. Instead, go to Galilee. Go to, to Nazareth. And as a result, this divine initiative Joseph does that, and from that we know that, that, jo- that, that, that Jesus was raised in a more rural environment. I mean, I say this a bit tongue-in-cheek, but more hick town. I mean, Nazareth and Galilee, they had their own dialect, they were a bit more rural fishermen and carpenters, whereas Jerusalem, the metropolis, is, I guess, where Joseph thought Jesus should be raised, but, but God determined that Jesus would be raised in Galilee, specifically in Nazareth, around carpenters, around fishermen. Why, I don't know. I don't know the mind of God. But that is the divine initiative that we're talking about today. First of all, how do we hear from the Lord in times of trouble? I'm going to create three scenarios. I'm going to talk about three scenarios today because I, I think really practically, as I already said, God brought you here today to speak to you. And I think practically there are three areas that many of us are in, even this very moment. Like maybe you're having a hard time listening to the sermon, and maybe it's not because I'm boring. Maybe it's just because you've got something else that just, it's just really on your mind. It's just really bothering you. need to hear from the Lord. And perhaps it's because you're going through a time of trouble. I ask, don't answer out loud, but I ask, are you, are you in the midst of this right now? You're going through a time of of trouble. Joseph and Mary were troubled. The ruthlessness, and they're still in Bethlehem, the ruthlessness of King Herod's latter years, especially when threatened by political rival, uh, it's, it's well documented. I mean, the list begins, as I said last week, with with Herod's uh, three of his biological sons that he killed uh, because they were a political threat. How Archelaus made it out of that, 
lived, I don't know, but there were three biological sons that he killed because he sensed a threat politically. So you can see why he wanted to kill this Messiah, this Jewish baby that that, that people were now calling the, the king of the Jews. He killed, he killed, Herod killed hundreds of babies in Bethlehem. But it, perhaps as many as a thousand baby boys under the age of two were killed in that season in Bethlehem because Herod was ruthless, he was insane. And here's, here's where I really want to camp out for a moment. Mary and Joseph were rightfully troubled. Man, if you're one of those people that would have gone to them and said, Dad, don't worry about it. There's no, it's, 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 it, most, most of the bad things that we worry about don't happen anyway. Like, that wouldn't have helped them. I'll tell you this, in, in times of deep trouble, Christian deism isn't much help. Because in times of real trouble, you need a Savior. Right? You need, you need one who saves. You need, you need a divine initiative. You don't need more common sense. You don't need more creative thinking. You don't need reasoning tactics and, and high-level thinking ability. No, we need a Savior. We need the divine to come and initiate. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there today where you say, I don't even know, God, I just want you to tell me. And I'll do that. Perhaps today, perhaps this very day, you feel vulnerable. Like Mary and Joseph. They weren't influential. They they, they weren't wealthy. And maybe you feel this. Maybe you feel like, like a more powerful person, like he's got your number, is, is, is out to get you. And maybe for some of us here, maybe from a human perspective, <clears throat> that is reality. You're in too deep. You're, you're troubled. You're, you're in trouble. You're... You're under someone else's influence. You have reason to be troubled. What do you do? A creative action plan won't help at that time. Your Heavenly Father invites you to call on Him, to call on His name. To humbly, submissively say, God, if you will think for me, if you, if you will tell me what to do, I will do that. Psalm 45 says this, God is our refuge and strength. He's an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Your Heavenly Father invites you to call on Him. The angel of the Lord said to Joseph, get up. So he he got up. Perhaps he had the strength to do nothing else but be obedient. Second second scenario that I want to look at today, which maybe you need to hear from the Lord in, would be this. 
Hearing from the Lord in transitions and new, and new beginnings. And hey, that's good. I mean, that's a good place to be. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're going through a transition. Sometimes transitions start out sad, but they, but they turn out to be really good things. Uh, maybe it's a new beginning, a new start for you. Surely some, some of you in this room today are, are going through that. So, so in, in today's passage, what happens eventually? Herod dies. I mean, that's simple enough. We find that in verse 19. Herod dies, and this opportunity opens up. So maybe, maybe you've gone through, uh, and I certainly hope not, but maybe you've gone through some tragedy, but now it's opened up like some, some new start. An opportunity for Mary and Joseph opens up. Uh, they didn't, I don't believe, want to spend the rest of their lives in Egypt, in a foreign land. Egypt, historically, at that era, uh, Egypt was a place where Jews would run for respite. They would leave Israel uh, for political respite, uh, to, 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 st- to stay out of jail. To, to, they, for some reason, Egypt was just a place where they could go when they needed to get out of town fast, right? But that's not the kind of place you want to stay, right? It's like Australia. You don't want to stay there, right? You want to get, you want to get back home. And, and so, uh, so Joseph and Mary are living, you know, out of their travel trailer in Egypt, um, they're, they're living on the gifts, potentially, uh, provided by the, the Magi. But, but they don't want to stay there. They just want to be there for a while. So, the Lord says, I've got a new start. I, I, I've, got a, I've got a new beginning. And now I'm, now I'm talking to you. And the challenge with that is, um, some of us, we are so stuck in, in, in our old ways or in, 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 in guilt and remorse or in our uh, conservative reasoning abilities, like, like I shouldn't make too many changes in life. And so we, we, sort, of, we sort of spiritualize just being stuck where we are. And I just want to say for some of you today, the Lord is calling you to a new start, a, a, new, uh, a new beginning, the, the, the 2.0 you. He's got something new on the horizon for you, and it may not make sense. All of your intellectual reasoning may say, no, it's not time for a new start. It's not time for a new beginning. It's not time for a transition. And yet, Perhaps the divine initiative would say otherwise. I, I, I can, to some degree, re, uh, uh, feel what Joseph probably felt, relates to Joseph, the sense of, man, I just, I just moved Mary twice and, and, and this baby once, you know, I moved, I, I, dragged, I dragged Mary from, from Galilee to, to Bethlehem. And then I dragged Mary and this baby all the way to Egypt. You know, and now there's, there's a lot of miles on the, on the travel trailer. There's a lot of miles on the truck. I don't know if we'll make it, be able to make it back. Maybe we should just stay here. Just eke out a life here. And yet, and yet God, not through Joseph's intellect and, and reasoning and his calculated, determined thoughts. No, no, not through that, but through the divine initiative. God says, it's time to go back to Israel. It's going to be okay. And it says once again the exact same words. The angel of the Lord said, get up. So Joseph got up. The last 
scenario that you might be in today, which is quite akin to scenarios one and two. There's a little bit of three in one and two. The last, the last uh, scenario for you uh, t- today that we're going to look at would be this. Hearing from the Lord in the midst of deep fear. I mean, when you're in trouble, when somebody has, has got your number, when, when you've lost control and, and somebody else has gained control, that, that, that leads to justifiable fear. But also in times of transition, in times of new beginning, there's, there's often deep fear. In, in this story, uh, in the story of Joseph and Mary preparing, locking the, locking the, uh, the cabinet doors on the travel trailer so stuff doesn't fall out and making a little place for baby Jesus to be, uh, who at this point, you know, is probably several years old, so that they can, so they can go from Egypt back to Israel. They're getting all these new opportunities. The Lord is calling us back to Israel. We're going home. You know this. In, in the midst of those, you know, for some reason I'm thinking about my, my son's move uh, several months ago to Alaska. In those new opportunities, they never go as smoothly as you think. They never go as smoothly as you would like. Why is that? It's cause, is, is the Lord tricky? Is the Lord like to watch his sweat? Or is there something deep, profound to be gained in the midst of that. At some point, at some point, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of new, exciting opportunities, at some point, we have good reason to freak out, to struggle with fear. Maybe even feel a a sense of hopelessness right in the middle of the journey. In Joseph, I mean, in, Ma- in the book of Matthew, just as Joseph decides to return to the region of Judea in Israel, a detail causes him deep fear. He's told, yes, King Herod, actually he finds this out, yes, King Herod has died, but now a much more ruthless ruler, his son, is wreaking havoc in what was called the southern kingdom. Archelaus, no less ruthless than his father, is now ruling in Judea. What he doesn't yet know, Joseph, is that that the brother, Herod Antipas, was ruling in Galilee. And it's a much more stable situation. It's a much apparently better situation situation for the Christ child to be raised in. Are you struggling with fear today? Don't answer out loud. Are you struggling with fear today? Whatever your scenario, if you're right in the midst of gut-wrenching trouble, if you're right in the midst of sorrow, or maybe you're right in the midst of a new beginning, a new era, nonetheless, whatever situation you're in, are you struggling fear. I've come to realize, having pastored people for, for three decades now, but also just being a human being, because I'm way more like you than you think I am. Um, I've come to realize that, that a deep source, a great source, an uncovered, often nebulous source of fear in our lives is the hurdle of shame and embarrassment. I've failed in the past. I might fail in the future. Maybe I'm just a failure. There's, there's at least one good reason, I believe, and I'm sure there are many, why Jesus was born and raised in Nazareth. I think it was to teach us common folk something about 
what can come out of Nazareth. You see, simply to be raised in Nazareth, it meant that you were called a Nazarene, which was a derogatory term, actually. In Jerusalem, they'd say, they're Galileans, or they're Nazarenes, and it meant that they, they, had, they, they, kind of, they kind of talk like a hick. They kind of, they kind of weren't up to par with everybody else. John chapter 1 Verse 45, the potential disciples are just meeting Jesus. Just finding out about Jesus. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the Messiah. We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one. And they probably had known him. Some of the disciples had grown up around him in the same region, you know, played baseball against one another in the summer. We found him. It's actually Jesus. You know, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And what is, what, what's the response to that? Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. And what did Philip say? He says, just, just come and see. Here's my point. For, for, for some of us, our fear is born out of shame, embarrassment, just a fragile spirit that says, I, I, I failed in the past. I, I might fail again in the future. I, I, I'm, I, I, carry, I carry shame. I, I walk with a limp. And what Jesus, your Savior and Lord, would say he would say this. He would say, I can sympathize. He would say, I know how that feels. He would say, you should, you should hear all the things that they used to call me when I, was, when I was on earth. If you're struggling with fear today, in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of the chaos, if you're struggling with fear today, in the midst of a new beginning, in the midst of a transition, if you're struggling with fear today, hear me, the antithesis, the opposite of fear is not courage. It's not. Not, not within the Christian ethos. The opposite of fear is not courage. Not within Christianity. Within, within reasoning and humanism, yes, it is. And I get that. And there's a place for courage in your life, I suppose. But that within, in the Lord, under the Lordship of Christ, in the kingdom of heaven, the antithesis of fear is not courage. The antithesis of fear is being filled with the Spirit of God. 2 Timothy 1 says so. You don't have to believe me. The Apostle Paul tells us. He says this. And this is the famous, don't read it yet. This is the famous passage, like God has not given you the spirit of fear. And we all like we 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 tell ourselves that. We don't remember what he did give us, but we God didn't give us the spirit of fear. I'm to be a courageous warrior. But that's not really what it says. Now, this passage that we're using the NIV here, so it says he didn't give you the he hasn't given you uh, does not make us timid. But it's the same passage you've heard all your life. God has not given you the spirit of fear. What does it say? 2 Timothy 2.1, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is, you, which is in you through the laying on of hands. Okay, let's just stop there for a minute. It's already getting a little weird, right? Some of you are like, don't ever, don't ever do that laying, hand, laying on of hands thing with me. Maybe it says, I want to remind you, I want to remind you, he says to Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He's, he's saying exactly what you think he's saying. He's saying, remember, Timothy, don't be, don't be timid. Remember, remember the gift that God gave you when I put my hands on your shoulder and I prayed for you and something happened. What happened? Going on, it says, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. 
How do, we co- how do we overcome fear as Christians? Not by being more courageous. How do, we, how do we overcome fear as Christians? By the power and presence of the Spirit of God in our lives. We, we pray for it. We, we, we pray for it for one another. I pray that for you at this very moment, that the Spirit of God would overwhelm you would overcome you, that you would, that you would, by God's divine initiative, receive power and love and self-discipline. That is the antithesis of fear. So as we land this plane today, what I want for you and what I want for me and what I want us to pray for, is this a divine initiative? How do we experience this? How do we experience the divine initiative? And I'll give you two thoughts, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, and then we will run to Jesus through communion. We will... We will pray to Jesus. We will ask that the divine initiative would be active in our own lives. Two thoughts. I'm not going to project these. I'm just going to read them for you. How do we experience the divine initiative? Jeremiah 29, verse 13, it says this. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's too simple, Pastor Randy. I would say, no, it's not. The Lord Lord promises that if you seek Him, you will find Him. In other passages, it speaks as though He is actually going to find you. He He is hot on your heels. He is going to find you. But in this passage, What's being said by the prophet Jeremiah is, if you truly seek the Lord, you will find him. Not to be overly simplistic, but I have had good men speak into my life, and I'd say, yeah, I have been. And they say, have you really? And I say, you know what? You're right. I, 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 could, I can point my car, figuratively speaking, two directions. I can... I can, I, can jump on, I, I can head to Starbucks and jump on my laptop or I can head to my place of prayer and I can get on my knees. And we have that decision. And I mean this respectfully, but have you really made that decision? Because the Lord has said, and if He's a truth teller, then this is true, He has said, you will seek Me and find Me when you search for Me. How do you find the divine initiative? How do, you, how do you get that? You search for the Lord. Second thought, last thought, New Testament. The Apostle Paul, he says this. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And then he goes on, he says, especially that you may prophesy. I'm not going to get into prophecy today, but but Paul calls us to, 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 to time and time and time again as a, as a lifestyle pursue the spiritual gifts. And what that means is, Paul's also the guy that said to pray without ceasing. What's he talking about? He's talking about the, this, this posture that we, that we take time and time again where we say, look, God, I, I'm reasonable, fairly well-educated, I've got, I've got some creative abilities, but if I could just put that aside for a moment, what I need is a spiritual gift. Like if I was just going to be a secular human being and just live out my life, maybe I would have probably chosen a different profession. You know, I could have been okay. But I don't want to be okay. I want to be a Christ follower. So if I can just put away, put aside for a moment all of my abilities, I want, to, I want a spiritual gift. 
I want to hear from the Lord today. I want that for you as well. If there is more to this Christian life than just following the moral teachings of Jesus, which there is, there's more than I I want that. I want that for you. Bow with me and let's pray. God, we come to you today. As our Heavenly Father, we come to you today celebrating the fact that you you determined that you you love us to the degree that you would you would send your own son to earth. Long ago, you 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 looked ahead in time and and you looked at our sin, and you looked at our brokenness, and you, you, you considered this high hurdle of, of sacrificing your own son, and you said, I'll do that. I'll, I'll do that. And that's the gospel story. So we celebrate you, God. Jesus, we're told in Philippians that you didn't consider heaven and in home, something to be grasped, held on to, but you humbled yourself to the point of death and you became, a, you, you became a servant on our behalf. And the end result, the end result is that, that, that your name is lifted high and, and one day every knee will bow and one day every tongue will confess. And, and all of that is a result of you being obedient to the Heavenly Father. And so, so Jesus, we lean into you, we press into you today. We We really believe that you get us. You you understand us. You are sympathetic toward us. And so, Jesus, we say thank you. Holy Spirit, we believe you to be the the power, the presence, the spark, the divine initiative in our lives. And that's what we've talked about today. That's what we want. We don't want just good, sound human reasoning. We want you to initiate you to divinely enter into our lives, lead and guide. And so we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Would you work in our lives today? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we celebrate the Godhead. We worship you today. We pray this in Christ's name.